Hi, this is Jim from Track World, and in light of recent events, it's high time that we had a serious sit-down about Gene Roddenberry. We need to have a real heart-to-heart -heart on this subject. I'm talking about a no-holds-barred truth session where we lay all of our cards on the table. It is clear that we are overdue for a frank discussion to clean this air once and for all. And this is not just any old chat. I'm calling for a full-on reality check regarding the Star Trek creator. We need to stop beating around the bush and have ourselves a proper wake-up call. It's time to face the music and address some hard truths about Roddenberry's legacy, both good and bad. So buckle up, because this talk is happening now. We're going to dive deep, have a moment of reckoning, and hopefully emerge with a clearer perspective on the man behind the franchise. No more sugarcoating. Let's get real about Gene Roddenberry. So what do you say we get started with what Gene Roddenberry's legacy is? Now, Gene Roddenberry, the creative mind behind Star Trek, left an enduring legacy that is as expansive and expiring as the universe he envisioned. His groundbreaking work not only transformed the landscape of science fiction, but also established a new standard for inclusivity and optimism in storytelling. At the heart of Star Trek lies Roddenberry's vision of a united humanity that transcends race, gender, and nationality. He imagined a future where individuals from diverse backgrounds collaborate for a greater good, a concept that resonated profoundly with audiences during the 1960s. Now, Roddenberry's dedication to diversity was evident not only in casting choices, but in his commitment to representing a multitude of voices. Characters such as Lieutenant Uhura, played by Nichelle Nichols, became symbols for unrepresented communities, and in fact inspired many to pursue careers that were traditionally inaccessible to them. In addition to its social impact, Roddenberry's Star Trek ignited a widespread interest in space exploration and science. President Ford recognized his contributions by naming a space shuttle after the USS Enterprise, highlighting how the series fueled the enthusiasm for real-world science and technology. So let's face it, we're all Star Trek fans, and when you talk to other Star Trek fans around the country, it's almost impossible to find somebody who doesn't say that Star Trek inspired them in their career choice, that something they saw in the series, some ideal that they grabbed onto in their formative years, is responsible for what they ended up doing. Whether it was the pursuit of knowledge and science, or far more practical terms like engineering. And by the time that William Shatner became the oldest astronaut ever in space, there was already a long line of astronauts that all placed Star Trek at the base of their formative years. So ultimately, Roddenberry's Star Trek transcends its status as an established sci-fi series to become a cultural phenomenon, a landmark that inspires us to envision a brighter future. It serves as a reminder that despite our differences, we can unite to explore the unknown, both in the cosmos and in ourselves. And that legacy that he has left us is a never extinguishing beacon of hope, encouraging all of us to pursue unity and understanding in our own personal lives. Do you have a message that you would like to share with us and the Star Trek universe? If so, please call our user comments line and give us your thoughts. Now, Gene Roddenberry was 21 years old when he married Eileen Anita Rexroth in 1942. Now, after the war, he would take his first civilian job at the Los Angeles Police Department because his father had been a cop. Now, it was here that a promiscuous behavior would be noticed by his co-workers, who noted that Gene had had affairs with several of the secretarial staff. One question, he confided to a colleague that he and Eileen were unhappy together. Years later, he would then make the switch from the police department to Hollywood as a full-time writer. And then after a few years, he successfully sold his first series to the network. So the series was The Lieutenant. It was during this time period that he met both Michelle Nichols and Majel Barrett. Before long, he was actively having an affair with both of them at the same time. Both women knew of each other as well as his wife, and for a while he considered his relationships with both of them to be an open relationship. However, when both women were later cast in Star Trek, Michelle Nichols announced that she was no longer going to be seeing Jean as she didn't want to be the other woman of the other woman. Nonetheless, she was found at least twice hiding in his office at Desilu. The first time was during the first season 
when she was discovered completely nude hiding under a desk waiting for him to enter the office. And then a second time in season three, she was discovered in his office again. While not completely nude, she was far from being clothed. Now, meanwhile, as the series was getting underway, he put Majel in an apartment that he had gotten right near the studio. Initially, he had planned to divorce Eileen as season one ended, but then it was determined that the show was actually going to be renewed after a massive letter writing campaign that he orchestrated along with the help of Bujo and John Trimble. As a result, he postponed the divorce. Nevertheless, the status of their marriage was underscored when his daughter Darlene Roddenberry got married and he showed up with an old girlfriend. Furthermore, he spent the entire night in front of everybody discussing all of the different women he'd had affairs with while still married to Eileen. His plan was to use his daughter's wedding to publicly shame Eileen in front of the rest of the world. Two weeks later, he packed up his bags at home and walked out. Needless to say, where he walked to was Majel in the apartment. However, we never heard anything about Eileen, Darlene, or Dawn from Jean, except for a very unusual interview where he talks about having two baby girls. And I'm going to pause this in a moment and let this interview play out for you because you're gonna want your undivided attention is this interview is going to be uncomfortable. See you in a few minutes. I've been very fortunate in family. Uh, I've had two marriages, both happy. In my first marriage, I had uh, two lovely daughters, and uh, I had the joy in that marriage of, of girls. And girls are such delicious, sweet-smelling, wonderful things. I, I can still remember when they would, they, they would, when they would be so clean and their hair done, their starch dresses, and and how when they would. Uh, bend over, the dresses would come up and that you'd see the panties and and it uh, they just little girls are just totally beautiful things. If you have any videos, photos or documents that you would like to donate to us, please feel free to send them to Jim at trek-world.com or submit them via the web at submit.trek-world.com. So now that we've actually covered the affairs of the divorce, Let's talk about the last few remaining hot points that existed when he was still with Desilu and Paramount. Number one, he actually told the director on Where No Man Has Gone Before that the reason he hired Andrea Drum was he wanted to be able to sleep with her. That was it. And then, of course, his late night casting sessions in his office were quite famous at this particular time. The worst of which occurred on his birthday one year when a group of barely dressed women went into his office, and they partied. Now, ironically, this was nothing really all that unusual for Jean, but the response was, we talk all the time about how Lucille Ball saved Star Trek, and there's been some arguments exactly as to what was it she did to save Star Trek, but there's no arguments here. So Lucille Ball heard about this, and she was not pleased. She went to one of her people, and she said, you go to him, and you tell him that I know what happened, and this kind of behavior will not be tolerated at Desilu. And so the guy went, and he told Gene that. But far from being chastised or even embarrassed, Gene actually reveled in the fact that it got all the way up to Lucy. He had already told the casting director, if you're going to hire any girls, they need to come through me. They need to interview me in my office directly. Then we'll determine whether or not they're hired. And probably most famously of all occurred with Grace Lee Whitney. Now, we're going to actually do a video in the future on Grace because her story is really tragic. But suffice it to say this. She had been hired to be originally one of the big three in Star Trek. Most of the publicity pictures that she took, she took with Shatner and Nimoy. She was to be a primary character until one night when she was sexually assaulted by an executive at Desilu. The very next day after that occurred, she was let go. The decision was made by Roddenberry. The official story was... They didn't want to tie Kirk down with one particular woman, which is BS because we're not even four or five episodes in at this point. He should have thought about that, I guess, before he created a character that he didn't want to use, right? And then, of course, there were other people who said, oh, it was budget cuts because she was getting more than any of the other female actors at that time. She talked more about this in her memoirs when she published them later. She never identified Jean by name. And the reason she didn't identify my name is she said she was afraid for what would happen to her in Hollywood. And she pointed a finger at whoever it was that did that to her. There is, however, a section in that memoir 
where she mentioned this particular executive was actually involved with polished rocks as a sideline hobby. Interesting because it just so happened that Jean and Majel were known to polish stones with little rock tumbler things. Even as the memoir was printed, she said point blank, I knew that a single call from Jean would have saved my career. Never came through. Of course not. And upon leaving Star Trek, it didn't get any better. His reputation when they were doing pre-maids all in a row was very, very wild. And the movie pretty much borderlined on exploitation rather than drama or action. But for me personally, the biggest surprise came when Susan Sackett published her book. And in it, she had talked about how she had also had a running relationship with Gene since way back then to right up until his death. And that just as we already know that Gene did with every other person that he cheated with, this was known to Major, and Major was basically in no position to do anything other than acknowledge it and keep going. Not a really good way to treat your wife. It wasn't just the affairs that also made him somewhat notorious. Gene was notorious for stealing credit from other people's accomplishments. Best known example, right in the beginning. You own a copy of The Making of Star Trek? If you do, in the beginning of that book, it actually lists the lyrics to the theme song. Ever wonder how they got there? Alexander Courage wrote the theme song, and when it came time to file the music copy, Gene hurriedly scribbled a set of lyrics, added them to the music, and submitted the copyright in both his and Alexander's names, effectively stealing 50% of the ownership from Alexander Courage. Alexander Courage did not like this. He couldn't do anything about it, but he never did another thing for Gene as long as he lived. And that was just the beginning. We already know about how the writers have been upset with him for rewriting their stories, adding his name to their teleplay so that he could get part of the fees that were being paid for these people. He actively took film cells that actually belonged to Desilu and he sold them at conventions and later in Lincoln Enterprises. When he needed extra scripts, he told the studio to print them and he'd sell them at Lincoln Enterprises, misappropriation of funds, okay? I could go on and on and on with this kind of stuff. Every showrunner that ever worked with him in the original series parted in bad terms and did not ever want to work with him again. When Star Trek the Animated Series came up, Bob Justin said, nope, not interested. Couldn't get anybody really to work with it. NBC said, yeah, you, we can do this, but Filmation has to handle Rodbury. We don't want any part of him. And when they tried to get people to come back and write scripts, they ran into a problem. A lot of the people they reached out to were people that Gene had taken credit from their earlier work. We did get people who wrote scripts. We had David Gerald and Bim. We had a bunch of people, Larry Niven with a slaver weapon. And of course, Walter Koenig for the Infinite Vulcan, if I remember correctly, which he got simply because they didn't want to pay him to appear in the series. They didn't even tell him actually the series was being made. He found out when he got asked about it at a convention by a fan. He was the only person that was not brought back the only one but they brought other names back to do guest roles so star trek the animated series closes and now we begin working on star trek the motion picture and his relationship with people like harold livingston is legendary on how he basically tore those relationships up they had to beg livingston to come back on numerous occasions to do script rewrites and polishings because the script that Roddenberry had in his hands would not work, but Livingston had already walked away more than once saying, I can't work with this guy. We go through Star Trek, the motion picture, and Paramount does the smart thing. They kick him right out of Star Trek. Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, until we get finished with Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, all made by Harv Bennett with little to no input from Gene. Gene was invited to submit comments, and oh, he did. But they were under no obligation at all to actually respond to them or take those suggestions and make them part of the scripts. Gene was so upset about this, that they elite the script so they could be picked up by the mainstream press. What he didn't know was that after the issues they had with security in Star Trek motion picture, every script was identified in such a way to be able to trace it back to the person the script was given to. And the leak came from Gene. And now we get into Star Trek The Next Generation. He approached everybody that had been involved before and a lot of people wanted nothing to do with him. But some of the people agreed to come back because, quite frankly, they're invested in the show, just as we were. So, you know, DC Fontana came back. David Gerald came back. Bob Justman came back. There were quite a few people. These relationships pretty much nuked themselves 
by the end of year two, David quit, Dorothy quit, a bunch of people behind the scenes quit. They all said they never wanted to work with him again. They had had enough. But by that time, his health began to fail. And the last few years of Gene's life, admittedly so, were not the best in his life. But he brought all of that on himself. If you get the time, look up the coroner's report. You'd be surprised at what you find in it. And that pretty much brings this to a conclusion. The fact of the matter is, I love Star Trek. And I owe Gene, and you owe Gene, we all owe Gene a debt we can never repay for what he did by giving us Star Trek. He changed our lives, and that is not melodramatic at all. We've got people that are astronauts because of Star Trek. We have software developers, computer engineers, doctors. This, the list goes on and on. You've heard them as much as I have over the past 40, 50 years. Star Trek's beacon of hope for humanity inspired us all, and our lives changed as a result of it. I challenge you to find any other literary product that has had such an impact on the popular culture. But his legacy stops at that. Star Trek, very good. Gene the co-worker, absolutely hostile and toxic. Gene the father, go check Rod Rod Mary's Trekkies movie documentary that he made early on, right around 2010, 2011. Watch that. You'll find out what Rod felt when Gene had passed and Rod started poking around in Star Trek. I'm glad he did, because it appears to me that Rod is a hundred times the man his father was. I'd like to meet you someday, Rod. I don't know if you're seeing this or not. I do know that there are Star Trek production people that watch these videos. So if you're out there, thank you, because we could have lost it all when you stepped in. Majel was obviously doing a wonderful job, in all honesty, of carrying it on after Gene left. And even better, we even saw photographs in public and stories of her and Rod. When was the last time we ever saw a photograph of Gene with Rod, or more importantly, with his two daughters that no one knows anything about? I'll let the kids speak for themselves, but you know what the story is. So anyhow, I guess this has been my short period of tough love. We have a lot of comments on this channel, and everybody's pretty much wonderful, but there are a significant number of people out there who have drank the Kool-Aid, for lack of a better word. When it comes to Gene Roddenberry, they're not hard to miss. There'll be the comments in the section about the Roddenberry haters and the people who just don't get it about how difficult it was for Gene to get Star Trek out the door and therefore we should, you know, ignore or forgive him his little foibles along the way. These aren't little foibles. This is wholesale destruction. So please, leave your comments below. Let's talk about this. We can take this conversation in a dozen different ways if we need to or we can just leave it behind and move on. What we will not do in these comments is attack each other. If somebody has an opinion, they have the right to say it, okay? If it becomes combative, the combatants will disappear. So now let's get up with the fun stuff, like this, right over here.